Hey guys, we are live. Welcome to the Bags to Riches podcast. I'm Zach Ginn, your host. I quitted my minimum wage bag boy job to pursue the riches of real estate investing at the age of 17 and never look back. I'm here to educate and inform entrepreneurs, young and old, how to become complete real estate investors by talking to the best and most influential minds of real estate. I'm joined by Stratton Brown today. Thanks for coming on today, Stratton. Thanks for having me on, man. Guys, if you don't know much about him, he is a former Division I FBS football player at Fresno State turned real estate investor. He's a YouTuber and most importantly, a husband and a father out of Fresno, California. So I want to get this out of the way first. I really appreciate you coming on. If you guys haven't seen my first interview I had with him, the card's going to be up above here. We had a talk about coronavirus before things just went crazy and um, I'm trying to bring having him on this podcast here i'm really excited but um thanks so much for coming on man oh yeah man thanks for having me all right so uh first thing out of the bat i need to know what is your bags to riches story man bags to riches i got two of them i <laughs> so when i was playing football at fresno state when i finished our 17th in the country in tackles and i was like man i'm gonna go to the nfl i'm gonna make all this money i was like i like to party I better learn how to invest my money or I'm going to go broke, right? So as I'm training for pro day and everything else, I am reading like Grant Cardone, what else, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and a couple other things just to try and see like, okay, what am I going to do with my money? I'm going to make all this money knowing myself. I'm going to party my ass off and it's all going to go away. So I better like learn what to do with it. I do everything. I go to the Seattle Seahawks. I get a shot up there. Don't know, I don't make any money. It's just a rookie minicamp invite. I come home and I'm like, man, do I really want to train again? Like knowing how hard I work, the amount of work I have to put into that to get a shot to maybe be able to play in the NFL again, or do I want to start a career? So I'm like, okay, I'm interested in real estate. I ended up starting a home inspection business. I did one mock inspection, went through the crawl space. And I was like, man, fuck all of this. I'm never doing this again. Like, cause we got to go through those crawl spaces that are like yeah. this big, I had to put on a headlamp, throw on some knee pads kind of wiggle around in there. It was awful. I was like, I'm never doing this again. But while I started that home inspection business, I was going to a bunch of different RIAs and meetups and just talking to people and everything else. And I met my first mentor and the guy who I eventually ended up working for named Alan Folio. And so like, I'm working for him and everything. Well, I'm out doing my thing. I talked to him one day. I was like, yeah, man, three years ago, I was driving a tractor. And now I'm making over six figures a month. I was like, what? He was like, yeah, man, I got 60 rentals. I have a portfolio in Indiana. I got a portfolio here. I do some lending, everything else. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Like, I didn't think much of it. I was like, that's really cool. And then just one day, I just decided to call him. Like, hey, man, so like, what do you do? And he was like, all right, what you need to do is go get this app called Property Radar and go start knocking doors. And so I just went and started knocking pre-foreclosures. Oh, boy. <laughs> and so I knocked so many pre-foreclosures that my pregnant girlfriend thought I was cheating on her because I'd wake up and I would go knock all day and then I'd come home when the sun went down. <laughs> and I kept doing that, kept doing that, kept doing that. And I eventually got one deal um, from a, it was the saddest story ever. A man, his wife had dementia and he had to quit his job to take care of her. And so they lost. So they're like, yeah, we can't make our payments anymore. So we paid for them to get into somewhere else, gave them money for escrow and everything else solved all their problems. That was probably the worst situation I've been a part of, like just sadness to where we could actually help someone. And then, so I do that. And then when my son's born, I'm still not doing crazy deals or anything else, just working with my investor. I'm driving around using the Mojo on the go app on my phone, cold calling and driving for dollars. And I have my infant son in the back of, this, of my little pickup truck. And I'm just driving around trying to see if I can pick up some homes. I cold called me get another like 600 square foot house and we wholesale that to a guy I know. And then from there, I worked for him for a while. I did some really awesome things. We like wholesaled 16 units. We built out an entire in-house call center, handled like all the office management and everything else. And I, at a point in time, I was like handling a lot of stuff in the business. And obviously it was still all him. But I was like, yeah, you know what? I think I just want to make more money. Like I'd like to do this on my own. So I go, I'm like, man, I'm gonna be a millionaire in like a couple months. <laughs> I break off on my own and then I do one deal 
the first month I break off from him for five grand. I don't make any money for the next six months in real estate. Oh my God. Right. So I make, I do one deal for five grand. I'm doing that. I'm like, oh man, oh man. Okay. Money, money's gone already. Like five grand. If you're running a business, that's not enough to cover overhead. And so I was like, oh man. So I had to start donating blood oh every week God. to make ends meet. I sold everything I had just to pay rent. And then my son and I lived off of like bananas and rice for the longest. Just because like all my extra money, I'd be like, okay, well, we can eat this. We can eat spam, rice, bananas. Like we'll be fine, baby food. And then I'll throw all my money into marketing so we can get some more stuff going. I pick up a job like knocking doors for solar. I pick up another job selling like online marketing. And then eventually I get another deal and we pop it off for like 30. But that like whole, that whole six month period, nobody talks about like the trials and tribulations you have to go through and like telling your parents like, no, like I'm still not gonna get like a long-term job. I, this is what I wanna do, I know it's possible. So that's like my bags, like rags to riches story. That's insane, holy moly. I didn't know about half of that stuff, wow. Holy moly. I think, I think a lot of real estate investors could really relate to that story. I mean, in the past three months, three to four months of this coronavirus, a lot of them have just stopped doing deals. And, you know, either they're scared, they're trying to do virtual. I mean, wow. What got you through that situation? I mean, I didn't have any other life skills, bro. What else am I going to do? <laughs> well, didn't, didn't you graduate uh, from college? No. So I dropped okay. out of college because okay. I could take my son to the investment company I worked at, but I couldn't take my son to school. Oh. Uh. And so I was like, well, I'm making decent money at this investment company. Like I can always come back to school. And I just wanted to be like, hey, I can do it without college. So that's what I decided to do. I mean, it may have not been the smartest thing, but I was like, hey, I'm some awesome entrepreneur. I'll do it. And obviously now I'm successful mm -hmm. to an extent, but yeah, that's what I did. Wow. Yeah, that door knocking, man. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I used to do a little bit of door knocking. It takes balls of steel to do that. Yeah. Um, I mean, you just get used to it, bro. No, I, oh, <laughs> I know. It's from cold calling. I never got face from people cursing at me. But in person, it was a little weird, a little more different. But um, I got used to it pretty well. But uh, wow. So let, let's talk about you transitioning from that sweat equity type stuff. I mean, during that six month period before you start getting the ball rolling, I mean, what was your marketing? Um, cold calling, bro. Cold calling. Cold calling. And I'd play like Civilization Revolution, Dragon Ball Z or something else. And I'd cold call. Hmm. So I'd be on the phone for like six to eight hours a day, just like playing video games or watching YouTube videos or something to keep myself not bored and cold calling, just trying to get leads, trying to get leads, trying to get leads, trying to get leads. Mm -hmm. And so now with your success here, what, what is your marketing channel now? Um, cold calling, texting, and PPC. We did do Facebook, but it honestly just didn't pan out. Yeah, I've, I've been there with, with Facebook. I've tried it. I think we've broke even barely. I, I think we're still in the red on Facebook ads, but I mean, like one $10,000 deal like 12,000 ad spend. It's just the time and effort on that just makes no sense. But I mean, you're obviously not cold calling eight hours a day. Now uh, you got better used to your time. I mean, who are you using to a cold call for you? So I started a call center. It's called call magicians. Okay. And so we have four people with them who cold call for us all the time for six hours wow. a day. Wow. Are they American? So they're South American and Filipino. Okay. I've been seeing a lot of people shifting towards South American. It's pretty interesting. So, um, yeah, let's talk about Fresno. I think Fresno is an interesting place. Um, we had Kyle on, but Kyle, Kyle knows a lot about the Airbnb rental space in Fresno, but I don't think I got too much information from him about the wholesaling side of it. And I had Michael Zuber on too, but he's more interested in the rentals. He owns your office. It's pretty amazing. But can you tell me a little bit about the Fresno market? I mean, it's a basic, it's a little spot like Central California it's not like the rest of California. Like I'd say our medium house price is like 350 mm -hmm. in Fresno. Okay. So it's not, and then it's all agriculture, really blue collar. That's Fresno for you. Not a whole mm -hmm. lot going on. <laughs> a whole lot going okay. On. Yeah. So 
Uh, so how did you find Fresno as a real estate market? Is that just where you came after you got out of college? Well, yeah. So I played for Fresno State and I just never left. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I went up to Seattle for like a couple of days. And I was like, yeah, came back. And then I just never left because I ended up working for the other investor. And then I built my roots, built my network. Obviously, we'll try some virtual stuff. I tried actually doing, I did one virtual deal in Utah off of direct mail. And that was awful. Yeah, was like really? Another like five grand deal, like to where it's like everybody talks about these big checks, but I probably spent like five grand in direct mail, you know? Yeah, Let, let's talk about your, about that because virtual real estate investing, it's, it's got, it's really sexy when you hear about it. I can get a guy to sell me on it. I, I'd be all in on it. I've done virtual deals. I still do virtual deals, but I don't know if this is different with you, but with virtual, I can't get it done unless I got boots on the ground. Have you, so that virtual deal in Utah, was it all successfully like virtual? No one touched it. You basically got someone there and you got a cash buyer. Yeah. I mean, we still do virtual three hours each way. If it's okay. in Fresno, it's only me now. I got rid of my sales guy, but if it's in Fresno, like, okay, I'll go. But if it's like outside of Fresno, we're closing on one in Bakersfield. I've never seen the house. I've only talked to the sellers over the phone. I set my runner down there. Oh, wow. Like that's all we do. We'll talk to the sellers over the phone, negotiate it and everything else. Awesome. This is the price we're at. Send a runner in there. Everything's good. We have our cash buyers list. Are you guys okay at this price? Yeah, we're okay at this. Awesome. Done deal. Wow. It's not always that simple. But that's basically what we do is we get it locked up over the phone and then we'll send out a runner. Okay. And so what is your process in your entire business now? So you got a cold the, caller. Cold caller, text or PPC, lead comes in, it gets qualified. So if it's a hot one, it'll come directly to me. If it isn't, it'll go to our leads manager. Our leads manager will qualify it. If it's good and she does all the follow-up, then it comes to me or our sales guy and then we'll call them, talk to them, give them an offer. If not, it stays in the follow-up aspect until it's ready to pop. Then it's ready to pop, they'll send it over. Oh, and wow. at that point, you negotiate, talk to them, everything else, negotiate. Okay, we got the deal, send it over. And then, okay, we got it. Talk to our runner, tell our runner, hey, go out there. We need pictures, like we need like 100 pictures and some videos. We get the 100 pictures, some videos, everything. If it, everything is like the way they say it is, obviously it always isn't. We were about to buy a house that was only being held up by Jesus the other day. And we had to back it. <laughs> and so if everything is what to say it is, awesome. And then we tell, um, we just send our buyers the pictures of it's vacant. We just tell them to go look at it. If not, we sh set up a showing, just coordinate with them. And then our transaction coordinator handles like all the contracts and everything else. Oh, wow. And so how many deals do you think you're doing per month on a transactional level? Like three. Like I'm not some okay. massive, massive dude. We'll do, we did three last month. Mm -hmm. Two months before that, I'll do three this month and two of them I'm buying rentals. Oh, wow. Okay. And so when you said the hot lead, it goes right to you. Are a lot of these ones that are close, like in Fresno, within driving distance, are you going on these appointments yourself? Yeah, like if it's close and I can get on the phone with them and like, hey, I think it, it's worth my time to go over there. Because mm -hmm. you got to think when you go on an appointment, bro, you got all the preparation, the contracts, the pressure of the appointment on the seller. And you have to think about the commute time. Yeah. You could talk to a lot more people if you just stayed your ass at home and hopped on the phone. Mm. But you'll probably get a bigger spread if you go out there. So if it's in Fresno and it's reasonable, okay, let me go out there. It looks like a deal. Let's go see what we can make happen. Wow. So, yeah. So you physically go on the appointment. Is there a reason why you didn't take the approach and have like five sales guys doing like that whole huge you know, big scaled setup. I mean, for what? Like, you know how many leads it takes to keep those people busy? Yeah. That's a lot, you know, that, that's a lot of overhead. Like, <laughs> I don't want that type of overhead. I want like natural growth. I have some friends who just have like eight acquisitions managers, but they all yeah. hold them all day. The attrition sure. rate of that, I mean, I've built out an in-house call center and now I have an international call center. The attrition rate of people dialing on phones is awful. So I can't imagine like the in and the out and the in and the out and the people management. That's not what I want. Like I, I'd rather have one guy who's making great, great money and providing for his family and he's only working hot leads. Yeah. That's my philosophy. Wow. So are you mostly wholesaling now? 
or no. I, I've seen you get in some rentals and creative stuff. I mean, what's, what's Post the plan now? Units. Um, so right now the overall goal is like obviously to get units and we'll still, we still market to multifamily owners. We're looking at like a portfolio right now that I'll partner up with some other people and then create a finance stuff. Um, owner finance subject to. Okay. And so how does California work with the creative finance and everything like that? Are they more strict than the average ones, say Arizona, Florida? Oh yeah, bro. So we were going <laughs> to do, this is a story for you. I'm buying, I'm partnered with Kyle on this. We were going to buy a house. We we're going to make like 600 to $700, like net cash flow. Nice. But we're going to buy it subject to, it has a VA loan. And so what yeah. we're going to do is called a mirror wrap because you can't take a VA loan subject to because it'll call the note due. And so we had um, our transaction coordinator, Rochelle Jarvis. She um, called every single title company like in California to see if they could do this. And no one could. And we found one yesterday and it'll close on Tuesday. And like we've had this thing in escrow for a month, like searching, 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 searching. <laughs> And like talking to our like normal fidelity, they're like, hey, yeah, we aren't going to touch this. Hey, and yeah. then we take a different one, a different one, a different one, talking to attorneys and everything else. So that one's a little bit harder. But regular subject to, you're fine. If it's like okay. a mirror VA loan, they don't want to touch those. That's funny because most of these title companies, what, is there three, four big actual companies they run it through? It's just funny. Man. So... So you have the transaction coordinator cold call title companies for like a crazy one like that. Yeah. And so she's just um, by the file. I got referred from her by, from Pace. Pace referred me her and mm -hmm. she handled like all of his transactions and I just pair by the file. It's the best thing I've ever done. She makes sure like everything's in place, gets all those contracts ready, makes sure she's coordinating with the buyer, with the seller, getting everything in place. Best thing I've ever done. Wow. And that's interesting because I've we we've just been debating again a transaction coordinator or not, but um, what really, who really helped you set that foundation? Was it your earlier mentor Alan, or is it someone now that's in that foundation for that process you have now? Like my entire like lead flow process. Yes. Um, that is, I mean, it's a combination of both. I mean, I've spent a lot of my own education, and so yeah. I'd say it's a combination of both because originally with Alan. It was me, and then we had a transaction coordinator and like an admin person, and then another salesperson, and I managed the office. But um, it wasn't set up nearly the way we have it set up now. Like now, that the leads manager is awesome because, so the reason I let go of my sales guy is because he quit being on, like he didn't want to be on the phone. And I was like, well, we got to get him used to being on the phone and talking to sellers, right? And so he was talking to every single lead and we have something called seven days of hell. Any lead that comes in, they get called three times a day, every day till they fucking pick up. Right. And we use that with like smartphone and Podio so we can just like cycle through them because we're going to pay for that. Like we want to at least get on the phone with them. What happened is that all of his energy was like put into bad leads. So when the good leads were there, he was like burnt out. Like by the end of the day, he's burnt out because he feel like he's doing a cold con job. Yeah. And there's a work from home thing and everything else. And so that, that whole dynamic is really hard. So that, and before um, I had him on, I had a leads manager, but I was like, okay, he can handle his own leads. Let's see what he can do. And then by the time we were going to put it in place again, he was already, he was really burnt out. Wow. So, okay. So your cold, how many cold callers do you have right now in, in your center just for you? Just for me, I have four. Okay. And I'm just thinking about stats here. So you got four full-time cold callers. So how many leads would they be generating for you in your market? One to two a day. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. And so is there any way, because you probably spend a lot of money in skip tracing. So how would, how would someone get interested in finding people in cold calling? How would they, well, who would they use for skip tracing? If I don't mind me asking. Um, batch skip tracing. I have a mm -hmm. promo code of them. Just use promo code STRAT, S-T-R-A-T-T. And then the list guys are really good as well. Okay, the list, the list guys. Yeah, and they have like um, really good um, list source data and they have really good skip tracing. And then Batch obviously has like great data and great skip tracing and their texting platform. And that's what we okay. use for texting. Nice. So, so you use cold calling, so you're a big texting guy too then? Yeah. I mean, okay. big relative, relatively, I guess. 
<laughs> okay. And so if, if I like looked at a pie chart of your marketing, I mean, what, what percentage is cold calling, door knocking, SMS? I mean, what, what would that look like? So we shut down the door knocking because of COVID. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> we'll get that up and running again. So it go, I'd say 50% cold calling, 40% SMS, and then 10% PPC. Okay. Okay. So PPC, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I've, I've talked to a lot of guys about PPC. Um, Scott Oots used to be huge into it. He kind of stopped it and he's shifted to more of a direct mail approach. I mean, so PPC is still profitable for you. So we're just getting into it. Oh, okay. Like, I'm okay. starting to get a couple of leads, but um, I mean, inbound leads are a lot better than cold call leads, right? Yeah. So just the amount of like, the amount of leads you have to talk to inbound compared to the amount of leads you have to talk to from a cold call lead, it is drastically different. Yeah. And so I just want to see like, okay, what's that like? Because I know like Nick Perry a lot and he's nationwide and a lot of his marketing is just PPC. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the biggest like wholesalers in America. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I cannot tell you how, how better it is to just have the sellers come to you versus that. I, that's what I used to do. I used to just stick bandit signs out uh, in high school, like 100 a week, just boom, boom, boom. And they'd come to me. It was amazing. But it's a lot of work, man. Oh, geez. So do bandit signs work by you? Um, no, at a point in time, we were putting up like 100 a day when I was working for the other investor. Mm -hmm. And we just weren't getting a lot of traction. But wow. it's like, like anything else, if you throw enough at the wall, it's going to work eventually. Mm -hmm. But the cost for it and then the labor in it, it was like, yeah, I don't want to like now me personally, I don't want to set up the infrastructure to do it. Yeah, it's true. I mean, those bandit signs are just so much work and we had to hire people. It was a mess. But um, lately with SMS, we've been going crazy with that, especially with this COVID-19 thing. We had a huge drop last month, and then we got carrier-approved templates now. And now I'm back at my 90% plus. But um, yep. yeah, shout out to Batch Leads. We had uh, Annie on. She's great. She showed everything about it. It's a great, great service, guys. So if you're going to do SMS, go check them out. Use his, uh, use his code there. So, so you're starting to buy rentals now in Fresno. So how many years do you think it's going to take you until you're the next uh, Michael Zuber? Man, I mean, the end goal, I'll buy creative stuff out here because we have like marketing funded and deals just come to me now. Mm. The tenant laws out here are awful. I'm doing with, dealing with two houses right now that we're wholesaling that have tenants in there who we can't get out because of eviction laws. Yeah. All right. So like, I don't want anything to do with that. My, I've identified the market, Indiana, like that's Okay. When I really start like, okay, let's really start focusing on rentals. That's where I want to go. And hopefully I can build it a little bit faster than Michael did. But I mean, <laughs> it takes a while. I mean, he has 200 something rentals, you know, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> it takes, you a had, while. um, who do you have? You had Zach keeps on too. Like, like, and like Zach's got like insane. 200 something rentals too. Uh, do you manage him just like him? Right? No, I, I will have a <laughs> company. <laughs> Oh man, I, I asked him three times on our podcast. I said, so who manages? He's like me. I'm like, okay, I understand. But like who, someone's got a problem. Who do they call? He's like, my phone. <laughs> okay. It's, it's one of the most craziest stories I've heard. But so your tenant laws here in California, I mean, are, are they getting worse by every other year? Oh, they're bad, bro. So get this, this house that we wholesaled, I'm taking care of it for the person we wholesaled it to. We bought it from an 80 year old woman. Her 60 year old son lived with her. She moved out. The title company closed it faster than we anticipated. So they were still all in the house. The 60 year old son who has no claim to the house is still in that house because of eviction laws. Oh my God. That's and we can't insane. do anything. And he won't take um, cash for keys. That's the only way you can do it here in Florida. I mean, a lot of. Florida's a weird place. A lot of guys are okay with 500 bucks, but I mean, Florida's so tenant friendly. I don't expect it to be in the next couple, the next decade. But so you're looking out of state for these rentals here. And so are you looking more towards multifamily, single family? Both. I mean, I don't want to be some massive syndicator, honestly. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, maybe like once you get there, you get there, but that's not something I'd really want. Just houses and small multifamilies. Okay. And so what, so you started in 2017, am I correct? Like 2018. 2018. Okay. And 20, 2017 summers when I started. Yeah. 2017. Summer okay. Summer. Okay. Kind of the same time as me. You know, I think we both had rapid just growth versus the average wholesaler. I mean, what what really catapulted you? I, I'm trying to understand this. How did you have such a massive success in the short amount of time where it takes people like decades? Books. Books. I mean, I'm, I'm a woo-woo Bob Proctor guy. Like okay. Bob Proctor, Napoleon Hill, mindset, and then mentors, bro. I spent a lot of money last year on education. Mm-hmm. Like learning like, okay, what's going to make my life the easiest? And how's my business going to be more efficient? How am I going to have better profit margins? Like I spend a lot of money just to learn these things. And I'm in two different masterminds right now. Just trying like, okay, how can I better myself? How can I better myself? How can I better myself? And then throwing all your money back into marketing. Yeah. Like if you do, do one deal and you buy a car, bro, it, you just did a deal to do a deal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's the problem. I mean, that's, that's the main goal of wholesalers. I don't think a lot of wholesalers are where you're at, where they understand the mindset. Like they make 20K on a wholesale deal. They're like, I made 20K. You got to think how you stretch that money further, get a lease option, get private money, get more just cash flow, things like that. I mean, another question I have to ask is it's just, it seems like there's a lot of similarities between, I mean, I talked to Zach Keeps. He's a, I would call him, he wouldn't say, but he's basically a really great athlete and he's used his athletic success before into his business. Have you, have you used some of that mental toughness when it comes to being a division one football player into real estate? Without a doubt, bro. I mean like my entire, I was only good at football cause I worked hard. Like I wasn't that athletic. It was all just like hard work. And if you just apply it to the same things, it'll work to a respect, but then still like disciplines a muscle. If you relax it, you don't work out for a while, then you still have to build it all back up again. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt, D1 football and just men- being mentally strong and facing adversity helped a lot. Wow. So what would you say your highest highs and your lowest lows have been in real estate? Um, so my son and uh, my son's mom and I aren't together. Like We have a great relationship. But I remember one time, this is before that $30,000 deal closed. I had to call my mom to get $20 to get gas to go pick up my son. I get to where I'm going and I ran out of gas. So I had to call my mom for another $20 oh my God. to pick him up. And then the next day I closed the deal for like 30 grand. Wow. That was probably like my lowest point of being like, oh man, <laughs> broke. Yeah, that, that one was bad. At, at any point during that where you're like, I got to stop, like I got to get a real job and just stop. Like, have you ever had the thought of just quitting? Oh yeah, everybody thinks about quitting. This shit's hard. <laughs> like, well, you can't quit. Like, what else am I going to do? If I quit, what else am I going to do? Literally. Yeah. Nobody wants to hire on an entrepreneur. Nope. Oh, why I didn't get a job? Yeah. I, I thought about quitting. I mean, I just legitimately have no other life skills. Like my degree would have been in communications. Like you can't really do a whole lot of stuff with a degree in communications from Fresno State. I'd only worked for that other investor. I didn't really want to work for anybody else. I almost fought my D coordinator in college because I hated him telling me what to do. You know, like I have a complex. Um, And then I was like, well, what am I gonna do? Like I'm not passionate about anything. If I'm gonna do anything, I'll just go start mowing lawns or something. You know? Like I didn't want to get a job job. So that's why I kept going. I was like, well, legitimately, I was like, Strat, let's say you do quit. What are you going to do to make money? And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't know. This is the only way I <laughs> to make money. <laughs> so I just kept on going with it. Wow. Wow. That's, that's amazing. So what would you say, since you're a relatively young dude, or wh- how old are you? I'm 25. 25. So... Most 25 year olds, if I threw them in front of wholesalers, if I threw them in front of someone's house, say, this guy's a hot lead, you got to take him down. I gave you a contract. They would be peeing in their pants scared. I mean, what, how should young people go in front of appointments and just not be nervous or scared? Oh, confidence, man. Confidence. Mm -hmm. 
confidence, confidence, confidence. And then I'd find an awesome thing is knowing that the price you are at is something you can sell, right? So there's an investor in every market to where like, hey man, I'm gonna go to this house. What would you need to be at? And I have a couple in my market. They're like, hey, yeah, bro, I need to be here. I'm like, okay. And, then, and we'll back it out. I'm like, we'll just back out from there. Like, okay, we wanna make 20 grand. He'll do it for 70. Okay, let's buy it at 50. Wow. And if you do it that way, you have so much more confidence, like knowing you can close. You know what I'm saying? Because oh, a lot I understand. of it's like, oh, I don't know if I can close this. Who am I going to sell it to? Blah, blah, blah. If you just know like there's an end buyer like already, or if you work for another investor and just like take your lumps and learn a lot, that's what I'd say. Either find a, find a mentor, number one. Everybody hates on gurus. But like I pay a lot of money to a lot of people to teach me how to do shit. Mm -hmm. It's worth it 100%. I mean, a lot of people can do YouTube, but now it's so competitive. I'd say if you're legit, dedicated, you have the money, I'd find a vetted mentor, key vetted mentor, make sure they're doing deals and then do that. And then find like solid, solid buyers. Most of the solid buyers in your market, like say there's some big flippers, like they don't care. And you could even send it to Keegley. Keegley is nationwide. If you text the address to Keegley, they're like, okay, we could buy it at this. Back it out from there. And that way you know you're good. I love Keegley. I had, uh, Jamil's on too. You actually hosted him on your uh, RIA. But, um, but uh, on this one, I, I totally understand where you're coming from here. In Palm Beach County, I have some buyers in certain zip codes that they're like 30 grand for an info lot. I'm taking it. And I got like 10 uh, info lot guys interested in selling it. And, you know, one was to sell for 20. 25, 23, and I know like instantly like, okay, 23, we're good to go. Um, I totally understand about that. My buyers are terrible, but I mostly do wholetailing, so I, I deal with some cash buyers, but not too much in our market. But uh, yeah, to, to talk about just confidence here, I mean, how do you build confidence? That's the million dollar question though. It's, if you knowing that, if a guy who's new, he doesn't have those cash buyer connections, like, how else would you build that confidence? Man, you gotta go to Rias. Like, it's not just like, hey, like, I tell you one thing, I'm confident, I'm strong, I'm gonna close this deal. And a lot of it's like Napoleon Hill, like Bob Proctor, like I said, like yeah. woo-woo shit. To where, <laughs> like, yeah, like positivity, positivity, psycho-cybernetics, a lot of that stuff to build the confidence. And then a mentor is huge, man. Just having someone who would tell you like, nah, bro, you can't do that shit. I remember, <laughs> I remember being on the phone with the like, seller, and I was like, all right, man, sounds good. And I hang up the phone, and the guy I was working for was like, bro, you can't say that to him. He's like 65 years old. He was like, you gotta know who you're talking to. Yeah. But I'd say, like, you gotta go to RIA's. Like, if you're like nervous, nervous, you can find someone at your RIA who will go to an appointment with you, or just like, hey, can I go shadow you on some of your appointments? I'd go shadow them on all their appointments and see what they do, see how they talk, body language, all that. Definitely. I, I think that's huge. Um, I think a pretty important point that you make is you spend a lot of money for mentors and gurus. Um, we teach courses, but like, I, I don't want to get into that. But with you vetting, how would a guy, how should someone vet their quote unquote guru if they're selling, a, let's say a $400 getting started product? Like what's, they, they got the Lamborghini. That's all cool. But like, how are you going to vet these guys? Um, Steve, Tr Steve Trang vets anyone who goes on that podcast. Steve if, they're, if they're a guru and they've been on that podcast, like you're cool. Steve requires like HUDs, all that. And that's one way. Um, I'd message people who are active in the Facebook groups too. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you see someone who's like constantly doing deals and like, say you have a guru in your market. And then, so I just kind of like ask like around like, Hey, is he doing deals? Is he doing deals? Is, is this legit? And that way you'd know, or, and a lot of times, uh, it gurus get exposed a lot. I yeah. stay. Just make sure it's in your market is number one for me. Like I yeah. get a good mentor in your market. You can see that he's active. You can go to Ria's. Everybody trusts him. That is the number one safe bet. I wouldn't really go online and like buy something. I'm more of like a hands-on guy because if you go watch like fucking eighty PowerPoints, like you're not gonna get. <laughs> Yeah. I still not going to show you how to talk to a seller, like pull out a price point and everything else. Definitely. Uh, I love Steve Trang. He went on my podcast here. I talked to him. He's 
He's got the he's got something way better than Lamborghini. He's got a one percent market share, in Phoenix, Arizona, for his his entire brokerage. Right. Which is the craziest stat I think I've ever heard for like any real estate guru. Like he's an interesting dude, guys. You guys need to know about like your like the audience listening. It doesn't matter who what kind of car you got. It's what you got inside in your real business because Steve's not like that big braggy type dude. He's just like, yeah, I got one percent. Yeah, I did. I got five other guys here. You know, I got the biggest podcast. Like those, those guys are just so interesting, but that's amazing. But uh, yeah, so talk about your RIA. So what's going on with your RIA? Can you tell me about that? So with my RIA, we don't really, now all we do is like Zooms and I just go live on Facebook and stuff. Yeah. When it gets going again, I like to bring in people from outside of our market and then I'll still go over basic stuff every now and then. Mm-hmm. of how to run your marketing because i we i'm in a sales and marketing business i'm not in a real estate business you know like my entire sure. my entire business is sales and marketing if, if it's dispo and because i gotta sell and market for dispo i gotta sell and market for acquisitions that's all it is so we'll go over a lot of like um how to find cash buyers how to set up your marketing and everything else and then like we bring in pace uh, my friend mitch pomeroy talked the other day he has like 300 units he's a multi-family guy my friend Michael Ray is coming in to talk and he does a lot of flipping up in Modesto. I just like to bring in people who are from outside our market who can bring value. And we try and put on like a show. We rent out a theater. Like for Pace and Jamil, my friend Jason and I rented out a theater, had everything going. It was like the works. It was pretty cool. Yeah, just talk about that. So if you guys checked out one of the most popular podcasts is the one I had with Pace. Um, and Jamil was in there too. It was actually at Stratton's office he was preparing to go that day on, on your RIA and uh, yeah. a pretty cool, interesting story. If you want to see the background of that, but uh, yeah, pace on that part, he, he blew my mind on uh, sub twos. I was, I was like lease option, lease option, lease option. And he, he blew my mind there uh, in Florida and we've, we've gone crazy with that, but um, check him out. But yeah, RIAs are, RIAs are, is it, is it technically a RIA? Is it a meetup? Like, I mean, I, just, I have it as a meetup. I just have it on meetup.com. I think we have like 700 members. And I just send it out on meetup.com. We'd have it every third Monday. Like, hey, this week, this month, we're going to talk about this. And then we tried before COVID happened to have a meetup in our office every Friday, a a small one to go over like something. Okay, here's how we're going to break down comps. Like, here's how you break down a property. Okay, here's how you set up SMS. Here's how you really dial in your cold calling to make sure you're not doing anything dumb stuff like that. Here's how you're going to talk to sellers. And we just have it every Friday, just sporadically let people come to our office network and everything else. And it's a good way to get new people involved. Mm-hmm. And if they have a lot of questions, that way they can come to us and that you can vet them too. Cause a lot of, if you're going to RIA's commit, so many people try and waste their time and don't commit, just commit. I promise you it'll be the best thing you've ever done. Definitely. I, I mean, you're, an interesting question I got for you here is you're a very well networked man. Um, if I could say so myself, um, you've gotten crazy guys on your YouTube already. Yeah. Don Costa, Pace, Jamil, like, you know, a lot of people in the industry. I mean, as a young, like millennial man, like how did you get so well networked and how could someone trying to push themselves into the industry, get networked with like the Steve Trangs and guys like that? I paid to go to Steve's workshop. <laughs> I paid to go to Steve's workshop and I've been, I met a bunch of like people who I consider friends now. And okay. then when I go out and I go to a different event and with those friends, they have more friends and we all go out and party. I meet all them. Okay. And then I meet those friends and then I go to the next event and we all go out and party and I meet all them. And then you can just go through mutual connections and everything else. And so that's how my network is kind of built. And I, it's not crazy good. But I know a decent amount of people to where if I have a problem, I know I can call one of my friends like, hey, I'm having this issue, bro. How would you handle this? Wow. That's, uh, people are, I've, I've dealt with a lot of people, especially running the YouTube, just wanting like a bunch of free stuff. I love giving up free stuff. But, you know, a lot of people are just saying, hey, how can I get, you know, the, the best training possible in this for free? It's just like a lot of people are wanting everything without paying the price. And, so you're saying that sometimes paying for like a disruptor's workshop like has helped you a lot. Oh yeah. And I mean, so think about this. So I didn't pay for mentorship, but I worked for another investor who was really sophisticated for like a year and a half. Mm-hmm. 
And I didn't make that good of money. So that's me paying. And then I paid to go to Steve's workshop, Rafael Vargas, whole scaling, and I'm in two different masterminds right now. You know, like just paying to like get around people who are same mindset and better, people who are doing better than you. And like showing them like, if you talk to them and ask them the right questions, like, hey man, I'm hungry, I'm doing this, they'll, they'll talk to you. Especially if, if you can pay the money to get there, more than likely you're dedicated. Yeah, definitely. So uh, another thing here I wanted to ask you is you've had this on your Instagram bio. I didn't know much about it. I think some people who are looking you up, you know, they see your YouTube. They're like, who is this guy? They see this podcast. So what is the Lost Families uh, Foundation? So it's a nonprofit that me and one of my best friends started. Um, it didn't come out of like straight out of heart. So at a point in time, Utah medical marijuana was becoming legal, right? Mm -hmm. And so we applied and we came in 14th. I think they gave out 10 medical growing licenses, but we needed to have a nonprofit. And so I was like, okay, what would be a good way to start a nonprofit? And it's about, um, I'm adopted from birth. Okay. So my mother was a heroin addict and my sister was only a year younger than me and she kept my sister. And so me and my sister grew up in completely different lives. And my mom would go to like parent teacher conferences, like strung out and stuff. And my sister didn't have as an amazing life as I did, thankfully my parents. And so I was like, well, how can we step in and help these kids whose parents are struggling with drug abuse? They're going through rehab. They're trying to pull their stuff together. Maybe not. Maybe they're just on a bender and like the kid doesn't have a ride to practice. Maybe they can't afford any school supplies. Maybe they can't afford to go to a sports tournament. We'll just step in and provide those things. So it's like nothing's even happening. Wow. It's still active? Yeah. We aren't, honestly aren't very active right now with everything going on, but we'll pick it up again here soon. Wow, that's amazing. That's, that's so cool, man. And so if, if someone would want to donate to that or learn more info about it, how would they do that? Lostfamiliesfoundation.com. It should still be up. All right, cool. Yeah, I'll have the link down below on this one too. But um, yeah, to wrap this up, I got some more questions for you. Um, not a fun one here, but so how old do you think your son is going to be when he closes his first real estate deal? Oh. I'd like to be within the next couple of years. I mean, it's <laughs> August. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like it to be in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. That's that's so funny. So um, I, I'm the son of a successful real estate investor, so I, I like just talking to dads like that who want to get their sons into it. So I mean, Steve's pretty funny. If uh, I keep talking about Steve Trang, but he's he's interesting because he's like put negotiating into his kids every single day. And they're, they're insane. They're going to be scary real estate investors. I'm, I'm making my profits before they come in. I mean, are you trying to reinforce some things like entrepreneurial into your son as he's growing up? He's not old enough yet, but yeah, I mean, okay. that's the mental toughness, everything else. Try not to be too big of a dick of a dad. Telling him <laughs> yeah. Mental toughness. And then obviously negotiation, use your words or you don't get it. Like, Hey, why do you deserve this toy? Like, all right, <laughs> give me some reasons, man. Yeah, that's, that's huge. I, I mean, I, I'm starting to learn these lessons when I was uh, 17, 18. I, I feel like it helped me if I was a lot younger. But, I mean, where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years? Man, I want to have a substantially large portfolio. Like, wholesaling is cool. I don't know if I want to use that as, like, my end massive – conglomerate going but i'd like my call center to be running pretty well my wholesaling business at least pumping out 10 deals a month and if we can get 20 grand spreads i'm not mad on 10 deals a month and then having a substantially large pro um, portfolio i don't plan like five years ahead though okay all right and so what gets you pumped up every single morning to get out of bed and do what you do i like money <laughs> i like money i mean yeah, man. I just, I like money and I like to do what I want. Only way I can do what I want if I, is if I have money. You know, like if I want to go stop everything and be with my kid for a week, I got to be able to be financially stable enough to do that. hundred percent. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm not there yet. It takes like this whole thing. Like if you get into wholesaling, you're going to be rich, but then, you know, there's levels to this shit. There really is. You just see more and more and more and more. Like, yeah, I wholesale all the time, but Michael has 200 units and Michael just started a YouTube channel because he didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> I know. It's a huge YouTube channel too. It's massive. Like, but there's levels to this shit. Yeah. 
That, that's all. That's one thing everybody like, needs to know. And it's awesome, though, because it just makes you grow and grow and grow and grow and want more. I mean, really just growth, wanting rentals, wanting to do what I want. I want to travel the world. Definitely. Wow. So when you're saying growth, I, I think a big myth people need to understand about real estate wholesaling is it's a technically you can get rich quick if rich is 50 K, but I, I mean to build true wealth. Um, I, I think you're doing something pretty interesting is just, you're building a portfolio. You're actually building generational wealth for you and your family. I mean, that's something very, I mean, awesome, but, um, what do you think is the most important lesson you've learned on your journey right now in real estate? Man, just don't give up. That's what, when everybody asks me, right, you can't give up. I had a girl text me the other day saying like, hey, this isn't for me. I was like, Man, you can't give up. <laughs> if you give up, like, because if you actually get into this, it is such an awesome gateway into other things. Mm -hmm. Like wholesaling is just a gateway into so many different things. A lot of investors will start in wholesaling and then just break off and other stuff. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of wholesalers are watching this, like just wanting, they're grabbing on. They know, they know it works, but they, they really want to get into it. I mean, was there a moment that clicked for you saying like, hey, this is something I can actually do. I don't have to work for someone else for the rest of my life. Like this thing's legit. I can get this going. I mean, was there a moment where that hit you? Um, I mean, I guess when I did the five grand deal completely off on my own, did mm. it all generated, I was like, yeah, man, like I got this, whatever. And then for six months, I'd do another deal. But then like at that moment, I was like, I got this. Like it, it works again, you know, because even when, if you do it with someone else, you still don't know if you can do it by yourself. Yeah. Totally agree. So to end this up, um, you guys need to check out Strat Brown on YouTube. It's S-T-R-A-T-T -T Brown on YouTube. And we're going to end this out with the question I always ask every single person on this podcast. So I started real estate with no money at 17, like 200 bucks. So if you were 17 years, years old again, living in, you grew up in Utah. So what would you do with no money at 17 years old in Utah to become the next Stratton Brown? I would go to Aria and go find the biggest investor and work for him for free. Hmm. It's very similar to what you did. <laughs> like, I mean, if you want to be the best, you got to learn from the best people who have their own massive hedge funds broke off from working for a hedge fund, becoming a partner and being like, okay, I can do this by myself. Hmm. That's true. Thank you. Know? you so well, yeah, definitely. Um, it, it blew my mind just learning at other people. I look at Jordan Belford. He started someone else too, and he just branched out. And I think a lot of real estate wholesalers are learning that now. Um, I've had some fail. I've had sales guys underneath me that said, you know what? Just like you, they're like, you know what? I can do this myself. They go out, they quit, become a realtor. Never heard of them again. Right. So, uh, what, what, I mean, I guess I can ask you here. Like, what Do you see a lot of that happening with your sales guys? Um, my sales guy would probably try and do his own thing. Yeah. I mean, but it's a part of it. It's business. Like business is training your own competitors. Yeah, definitely. So I really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, I can't wait to see more of your interviewing styles on your YouTube. I, I think it's really interesting that you're just sharing your knowledge and you're continuing to grow every day. And I really appreciate it. Um, do you have any final thoughts before we sign off today? Check out our call center call magicians. They're awesome. Okay. Um, super easy, cheap, cold calling. One of the best decisions you ever make. So what is that website? Callmagicians.com. Cool. That'll be in the link below guys. Check them out. There's going to be a card at the end of this video to go click on them and subscribe. Check them out guys. He's a great dude. Um, Stratton Brown. Thank you guys. See you next week. Boom. Thanks. All bro. right.